Well, I have some remarks I'd like to share with you now. Just think about it. Four months ago, who would have thought or even dreamed we were about to get a global pandemic, something like the Great Depression and a worldwide civil and human rights movement at the same time? And now, until just recently, what was thought impossible became fact. Once bustling city streets turned empty and quiet, daily matter-of-fact airline travel ground to a halt, kids were told not to go to school. Places with some of the worst air pollution in the world suddenly became smog-free. Wild goats roamed the streets of a seaside town in Great Britain, and dolphins swam freely in the waters around Venice, Italy. Economies began to free fall. And so, after decades of slashing the welfare state and worshiping at the altar of the market, governments that until only recently had poured scorn on the idea abruptly started moving trillions of dollars into cash assistance, workers' benefits and grants and loans to tanking businesses. And, belieb and beleaguered Black Lives Matter activists, who'd been waging a thankless campaign for years, one that was almost wholly invisible to the media, the wider society, the centers of power, and us, have suddenly, spectacularly found their cause, their truth and pain brought to the horrified, rapt attention of the world, which, instead of tuning out and looking away, is responding with ongoing mass protests and a movement for radical change that's shaking the very pillars of power. Hannah Arendt, the great German-American philosopher and political theorist, once wrote that in times of crisis, even in the darkest of times, we have a right to expect some illumination. And these have been illuminative weeks. Several stand-out home truths have been laid bare, revealed, and illuminated for all to see. The first is the seriousness of truth. Accurate scientific, economic, political, and social information about what is happening somewhere, writes Cambridge historian Bill Foster, is suddenly valuable everywhere. It's literally a matter of life and death. We just might be compelled now to remember what we lost when we started to abandon trying to find truths together. Without truths, there is no trust. Second, the pandemic has proved that governments can act decisively to alleviate massive economic and social privation when the will is there. After having been preached at for decades, about the benign supremacy and efficiency of the neoliberal market state, after having endured decades of job precarity and cuts to social services, childcare, public education, and housing, suddenly we see that the decimation of the public realm, of the public good, was not a dire necessity, but the calculated decades-long political choice engineered by ruling political elites. And our children have hardly known anything else. This has been the world we bequeathed to them. A revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions, not for patching, declared William Beveridge back in the 1940s as he laid the foundations for the post-war welfare state in Great Britain. What will our nation, what will other nations look like after the short-term rounds of trillion-dollar stimulus spending comes to an end? Will we quietly acquiesce and return to the devastation and unbridled inequalities of market fundamentalism, of tax havens, corporate top, top dogs and their political enablers, or will we press for the socializing and humanizing of the economy, the society, and the state 
and thus work to achieve our half-built nation. I'm just going to say this. I'm sick and tired of hearing that we have an affordable housing crisis. Sick and tired of food banks and food insecurity. Wearied beyond words about the tax evasion and the billions lost to Canada yearly due to offshored wealth. Heart sick and pained about the missing and deaths of untold hundreds of indigenous women. Mad beyond words when I read of yet another young person incarcerated or killed by police as a result of a so-called mental health crisis or wellness check. Confused and angry about our own homegrown insidious systemic racism. And I'm wearied by the rhetoric that lets us off the hook when we say, well, at least it's not as bad here as in the States. I just don't want to hear it anymore. And I'm just going to say it. We don't have a housing crisis, a food crisis, a crisis of indigeneity and race, a mental health crisis, a policing crisis, or a budget crisis. We have a crisis of collective and political will. We have more than sufficient wealth, Canada, and we have uncommon, untapped reservoirs of goodwill and a wild hunger for fairness, justice, and decency if only we would forthrightly demand that we and our leaders commit resolutely to build this, our beloved half-built nation, and then persist and keep at it until it's more fully achieved. Even in the darkest of times, we have the right to expect some illumination, and I'm dying for some light. Sorry, but I've wanted to say all of that for a long time. Which brings me to the last thing I want to say about a truth that has been revealed for all to see during these past couple of extraordinary months and weeks. And that is, our well-being is social and relational. It cannot be achieved individually. To be healthy is to be whole. To heal is to make whole. And to experience that is to belong to and with and for others and the world. From the very beginning, Unitarians have affirmed that we live and move and have our being minute by minute by an inter-involvement, an interdependence with other bodies and a world of living creatures, natural orders, forces and cycles reaching down to the radiant fields of energy at the subatomic realm within, to the utmost bounds of nature beyond. 500 years ago, Michael Servetus, the first Unitarian, called it an infinite sea of substance, giving essence to everything, causing all things to exist and sustaining the essences of everything. Today, in the first source of our living tradition, we call it that transcending mystery and wonder which creates and upholds life. Our lives and that of all things are woven into one indwelling, continuous fabric of being that summons, summons us to wholeness and to plenitude. And there are consequences for that worldview. Consequences summed up in the vision statement of our Canadian Unitarian denomination, where it states that our interdependence calls us to love and justice. The first lesson a disaster teaches writes Rebecca Solnit, is that everything is connected. And we are living now in the disaster trifecta of pandemic, economic crisis, and the stark unveiling of racism and systemic violence, with the all-too-real fact of global warming 
only temporarily shunted to the margins of our attention. And what we need now, more than ever, is a much more robust commitment to the common good and the priority of the community over the individual and its slavish desire to have its own needs satisfied immediately. The past 50 years or so has been the most individualistic age in human history. Prominent leaders in the West have asserted that there's no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women and families and that it's our duty to look after ourselves first. Product advertising and globalization aggressively hype consumerism. Therapeutic culture markets self-help. Education programs privilege the building of self-esteem and popular media glorifies greed is good self-aggrandizement. This kind of immersion takes a toll on all of us. While a strong sense of self is essential to our dignity and worth, while a constant movement between solitude and company makes for a balanced life, worldwide data have confirmed marked increases in individualistic attitudes, climate and biodiversity crises, and a steep rise in isolation, loneliness, and emotional distress. When and where it has not been co-opted, religion is an affront to the individualistic ethos of our age because it dares say it's not all about you, not about the ego and its satisfaction. Instead, and if we'd only get this right, it's about envisioning and working for the common good. It's about the priority of the earth, summoned always towards wholeness and healing. It's about justice, equity, and compassion, a world upheld and transformed by our care and attuned to and living in harmony with the rhythms and systems of nature, all our relations beyond the self, and for the sake of the seven generations times seven yet to come. A colleague of mine called it fierce hope. And that's what I've been feeling in these plague-ridden economies, frighteningly on the slide, these Black Lives Matter months and weeks. We've seen clean air. We've turned to earth and potted plants on balconies and windowsills and baked our own bread. We've discovered how keenly we need the sight, sound, and touch of people gathered together. We've seen the impossible become possible. Our provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Hendry, has become an international rock star. Trillions of dollars materialized to staunch bleeding economies from homes to nations. We are live streaming our worship services. The casual cruelty and homicidal brutality of racism captured on social media has precipitated the shaking of the pillars and mass protests worldwide may yet upend entrenched structures and powers of evil. The penny has dropped. Our well-being is social, not individual. It's grounded in the priority of the community, not the consuming ego. It's fed by righteous confrontation, not the quiescence of realism and distraction. It's nourished by the wellsprings of justice and the bread of compassion. May these times be truly different with no going back. And may we and the many beloved communities find strength in our resolve to be generative and fiercely hopeful for the sake of those we love and the kind of world we long to see 
break forth into the light of day. And may it be so. And may it be so. Amen.